Hi guys, here we are back at the end of the day, and uh, we're going to hit the second half of the Gospel of Mark. I have, once again, 12 points. 11 and 12 are kind of long, so I'm going to do my very best to keep some of the earlier points really short so that we can make this another 30-minute lesson. Get your note-taking hands ready, and let's go. So we pick up with point number one, which is the entry into Jerusalem. And so this is really a big turning point in the story because Jesus' time as being a traveling preacher all over um, the area of Israel has come to an end. And now he is entering the capital city, Jerusalem, where the temple is. This is the temple that Solomon built. And this is the time of year when all the Jews celebrate Passover. So everything that we've studied about the Bible, all the high points of the Bible that we've been looking at this semester are coming together. So Jesus, along with all of his um, followers, his disciples, are coming to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate Passover. And I want to point out one little bit of symbolism that happens here. Um, he enters into the city on a donkey. And he's greeted by people who are already expecting him. He's famous. We've already talked about that. Um, so lots of people greet him. And um, it, it's a, like a red carpet treatment. This is like um, the way you would greet a king. But instead of a king coming back from triumph riding on a big war horse, Jesus is riding a donkey. This is, again, more humility, just like we talked about in the other lesson, this every man aspect of Jesus, which is such an extremely important part of his um, character persona. I'm going to throw in one other little idea here just to accent that every man uh, persona. Um, this is something that was not in the Gospel of Mark. Um, this actually comes from uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, which are Gospels that tell a longer story of Jesus. They actually talk about his birth. And you guys probably already know a little bit about his birth. This is the Christmas story. But um, he was born in a stable and laid in a manger. So once again, everything about Jesus' story from the very beginning um, has that everyman feel to it. And riding in sort of like a triumphant king, which the Messiah is born in the kingly bloodline um, on a donkey um, is very significant. And the people greet him, um, and rather than a red carpet, um, they throw down their jackets, almost like a red carpet, so that the donkey can ride across this... Um, so he doesn't have to like be be in the in the dirt in the stones. They throw their jackets down, um, and they also throw down uh, palm branches, um, and that is where we get the whole idea of Palm Sunday. And we'll talk a little bit more about holidays later in the lesson. Point number two: one of the first things that Jesus does when he gets there is go to the temple to offer a sacrifice. That's the reason all the people are there to begin with, to celebrate uh, Passover. So they're all going to make a visit to the temple, and they're all going to do a sacrifice. Now, they're not going to do a Passover sacrifice at the temple. The Passover sacrifice that you've already learned about is, is something that would happen in a private home in the evening um, at dinner. Um, but what they're going to do at the temple is something a little bit more small, a little more small scale. Um, and they're going to um, sacrifice doves. Doves are pure white, um, re uh, representing that archetypal, you know, color of cleanliness and, and perfection. So the people who are traveling to Jerusalem from all over the land to celebrate this highest of holidays in the most holy city of the most holy place... They're not bringing their birds in a little baggie from home because then the bird would be dead. You want to sacrifice a live animal. Um, so instead, they're bringing money and um, they need to buy the bird when they get there. And so it, it's kind of the temple is sort of transformed into this tour, tourist center where you can um, buy the bird that you need for the sacrifice. But in order to buy the bird, you have to have the right kind of money. Um, so they actually have to exchange their money there as well. 
So there's a lot of commerce happening. And the suggestion there is that the people who are doing the selling aren't doing it just from the goodness of their heart so that all of the faithful followers will have access to the right kind of animal for the proper holy sacrifice. They're making money off of it. It is tourist season. This is like trying to buy stuff at the airport where everything's jacked up 200% in price and people are getting ripped off. This makes Jesus angry because people are gathering to be uh, pious and godly and good um, and do what they're supposed to do and they're getting ripped off. Jesus loses his temper. He starts turning the tables over and scattering the money and he pitches a big fit. You could argue that that's not good. Um, certainly a lot of debate that could happen around the interpretation of this scene. Um, but he does pitch a fit. It does start a riot. It does get a lot of attention. And by the end of this scene, um, we've got the Pharisees and the Herodians because, of course, this is where Herod's um, palace is. Uh, they've had it. This is the last straw. This is the absolute last straw. So after this particular episode, they say, let's get him. Let's kill him. He is causing trouble now in the capital city at the holiest time of year, and we can't have it. So this is the beginning of the end for Jesus. <laughs> So the next um, point we have, point number three, is um, how Jesus then gets very serious about his response to the Pharisees. Thus far in the story, he's been very clever, um, but he hasn't been like directly mean or threatening, but they've crossed the line. So he tells the parable of the tenants and the vineyard. Now, um, I'm not going to review that for you. You did get quizzed on it. Um, but this parable of the tenants, particularly if you got the answer wrong, um, those tenants, those guys who refuse to acknowledge the son of the vineyard owner, those are the Pharisees. And you'll remember that at the end of the story, the owner who cannot get these awful tenants to pay up, and they keep beating up his servants and killing his servants, and they, uh, the owner finally decides, well, if I send my son, they will pay attention to him. They don't. They kill him too. You see where this is going. This is not only foreshadowing of Jesus' own death, but the way he wraps up the story, it is a threat to the Pharisees. It's basically saying, I know what you're up to. I know you're trying to kill me. You will pay. So, um, And they hear him. They hear the parable. They're smart. They understand the symbolism. They know they're in trouble, so they have to pick up the pace, and they have to get it done quickly. Um, there's one more uh, kind of important uh, scene of teaching that I want to hit before we get into the dramatic conclusion of our Jesus story. And uh, so while he is in Jerusalem, uh, he has an opportunity to do some more preaching to the people, and uh, they ask him tough questions, as always, some of them because they really want to know the answer to hard questions. And um, some of it is because the Pharisees and the scribes and the bad guys are still trying to trip him up. So one of the questions is, well, should we still pay our taxes? Because remember, paying the taxes was a really big sore issue for the Jews because their tax money was going to Rome to Caesar. And if you remember some of your Roman history... Caesar basically treated himself like he was divine. So the idea of giving their money to Caesar was like a sacrilege. It wasn't just, oh, I don't like paying my money to the government. It was that, um, you know, times two. And so they ask him, should we give, should we even pay our taxes? Very, very tricky question. And one of uh, Jesus' uh, Jesus's answer is, again, one of his most famous lines, sort of like the house divided line that we've already talked about. Um, and he says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render unto God what is God's. Um, and basically what he means is money is a human thing. Give your human money to the humans. I don't care. Render unto God what is spiritual and from the heart. 
Um, and he's very clever about the way he does this. Uh, he says, let me see one of the coins. Let me see your money. Oh, look. Look whose picture's on the coin. You know, we have pictures on our coins. They had pictures on their coins. Caesar's picture was on the coin. He says, money is a state issue, a human issue, an earthy issue, a government issue. Just follow the rules and pay your stupid taxes and quit griping. I am here not to advise you politically and financially. I am here to tell you what really matters. And what matters is the things of the heart. And this is where we really get to the heart of Jesus's message. The other question that they ask him in this same chapter is, Rabbi, teacher, what is the most important commandment? This is definitely trying to trick him. You guys know about the Torah, about the law. There were 613 rules, 613 laws, 613 commandments. And to pick the most important one is a very tricky business because he's going to make somebody mad. Um, so what he does is he quotes the verse from Deuteronomy um, that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all, all your mind. And then he backs it up with another commandment and love your neighbor as yourself. So you can see what the theme is. And I think this was one of your quiz questions. The theme is love. That if you dig down into every single thing that Jesus teaches, you're always going to find love for God, love for each other at the core of the message. So love is really, really the theme. Okay, now let's get into the um, kind of the climactic action of the story. So Jesus knows that his end is coming near and so he find up uh, and Passover has come around. So he gathers together with his closest friends, the disciples that have been traveling with him, uh, and they settle into their Passover dinner. And at dinner, he says, I'm getting ready to leave you. Here's what I want you to do to remember me when I'm gone. I want you to eat dinner together just like this. Again, very earthy. This is all about love and community. And he says, so every time in the future when you sit down to this dinner, and Passover is a dinner they celebrate every year, so that means they'll always remember him. I want you to drink the wine, and you guys remember wine was part of the Passover dinner. There were four glasses of wine, you'll remember that. Um, and there was bread, unleavened bread. You remember that as well, I hope. He says, from now on, when you eat this wine and this bread, I don't want you to just think about Passover and Moses. I want you to think about me because I'm getting ready to die. And so when you drink the wine, I also want you to think about my dying blood. And when you eat this bread, I also want you to think about my dying body. It's kind of weird and gruesome because he's basically asking them to eat his flesh and eat his blood. We'll talk more about the significance of that later. Um, but that is one of the most holy ceremonies of Christianity. Churches today tend to call it communion. It's sometimes called the Eucharist. And then the other um, super significant ceremony in Christianity we've already talked about, and that's baptism. And we saw that at the beginning of Mark. So they're at the Last Supper, and afterwards, um, he knows what's getting ready to happen, and he's getting nervous. He's getting scared because, again, he is completely human in addition to being the Son of God, and of course he's scared of dying. If he weren't scared of dying, we wouldn't be able to relate to him, and the story would not be as powerful. So um, he goes to his favorite pray place of prayer. He goes to a garden so that he can sit in this peaceful, beautiful place by starlight and pray. And calm down. And this garden is called Gethsemane. Um, you read about it. You may not have known how to pronounce it because it looks like Gethsemane, but that's not how you say it. It's Gethsemane. Um, this is one of those really famous episodes from the Bible. There's a lot of paintings and poetry written about Jesus in Gethsemane because it's a very emotionally touching part of the story. He goes and he gets on his knees and he prays to his father. He says, please don't make me do this. He says, take this cup, which means basically, don't make me drink this cup of fate that's going to kill me tomorrow. Please take this cup away from me so that I don't have to drink it. And God doesn't answer. 
and he's scared. Um, and at the conclusion of this moment, this is when he gets arrested. So here's the kind of the tricky thing about the arrest scene. Um, because there's no media, no photography, everybody knows who Jesus is by word of mouth. Um, but the soldiers who are coming to arrest him, they don't know which one he is. Um, so the only way they know what, which one he is, is they've already made a deal with Judas. They've already told Judas, we will pay you to show us which guy we need to arrest. Judas agrees. This is the great story of betrayal. And the way that they agree that they're going to, um, you know, get the signal as to which guy is the right guy is this kiss. Probably the most famous kiss in history. Is not even a romantic loving kiss. It's a kiss of betrayal, Judas's kiss. And at this moment, they grab Jesus and they take him off to a trial. Okay, here's the weird thing about the trial. Um, and in my list, we are up to item number six. And we're halfway through at 16 minutes. So we might be on track for a 30-minute lesson. <laughs> Let's hope I can talk fast. All right. So they take him off to trial in the middle of the night. This is weird. This doesn't make sense. Let me explain. The people who want to kill Jesus, to arrest him and kill him, it's not the Roman government. It's not the Roman Empire. It's the local religious leaders. So he actually has two trials. You might have noticed that. And the first trial is the religious trial, and it's held at the palace of the high priest, um, and he is on trial for um, the crime of blasphemy, which we've already talked about. They thought he was a blasphemer uh, against God, very uppity and claiming to be the son of God and the Messiah, which obviously he wasn't, they thought. But he's also really popular. So they can't put him on trial in the middle of the day. They can't arrest him in, in the middle of the day. This is why all of this dramatic stuff has to happen at night when everybody else is asleep. So they grab him and arrest him at night in the dark. They drag him back and they have this trial in the middle of the night because it's sneaky. Um, and uh, it's, it's really kind of a setup. Um, they have witnesses who come in and give testimony that, that are, are lies. They misquote him and Jesus just lets it happen. He doesn't defend himself. He doesn't say, wait a minute, that's not fair. That's not a lie. I didn't say that. He just keeps quiet. Um, really, the only thing he says is he answers the direct question. The high priest says, do you claim to be the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus says, yep, that's who I am. And they go, all right, well then, obviously that's a lie. And it's the worst kind of lie you could possibly tell in the whole world. So you lose. You are convicted of blasphemy. And now we want to kill you, but here's the deal. The Jews can't just do their own executions because they are not the government. The government is the Roman Empire. So they have to wait to the next morning when the government opens. So the next morning they take him to trial number two, which happens by daylight. And this is where Pontius Pilate comes in. He's not Jewish. He doesn't even get what the whole Jewish thing is about. He's probably never paid that much attention to it. All he knows is that he's basically the governor of Jerusalem. It's a big festival time. There's lots of people around, and he just wants to keep the peace. Because if he doesn't, then, you know, he could get fired if there's a bunch of riots in his town and he can't handle his job. So he does what they tell him to do. Um, they haul him in. They rile up the crowd, and how this happens is really kind of strange because the crowd goes from loving Jesus the day before to screaming for his execution this Friday morning. And so Pilate goes, all right, don't pitch a fit. We don't want any riots. Let's just crucify him. We crucify lots of people every day anyway. We got two other thieves we're going to crucify right now. Let's just add Jesus to the list. So they drag him up this hill where they have the crucifixions because crucifixion was a Roman way of executing people in a really public, gruesome fashion so that people could see this dead body strapped to this big post and go, oh my gosh, I'm not going to cross the Roman government because I don't want that to happen to me. So they drag him off and they kill him. 
Now let's talk about what happens after the death. This is on a Friday. Saturday is the Sabbath. And when the body dies, the Jews had a lot of, um, a lot of rituals about what you're supposed to do to a body. And it has to do with those purity codes that we've already talked about. So they managed to get his body down off the cross because there's a rich Christian who knows Pilate and says, hey, please, will you just at least take us, let us, like, he's our special leader and here's the money, you know, please just let us take the body down. You had your way, you killed him. Let us at least take the body down and put him in a tomb. And this rich guy owns a tomb. So they take him down, but the sun's about to go down on Friday night. And so that means there's no time for them to do the special dead body rituals where they anoint the body um, with special kind of preserving perfumes and oils. And uh, because um, I'm saying a lot of ums, give me a second. You can't work on the Sabbath. And taking care of the dead body, even though it's holy and special, you can't do any kind of work on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath actually starts at sundown on Friday. And it's not considered over until Saturday is over. So they get his body down and they put it in the tomb and they close it off. And tombs like this have to be closed off with a big rock because rotting corpses smell bad. So they pull the big stone in front of it and they have to just leave the body to rot over the weekend because they're not going to break their religious laws to do a religious service. And so on Saturday, everybody just has to sit around going, I can't believe it. He was the Messiah, right? Haven't we spent the last three years following him around, believing he's the Messiah? But the Messiah is supposed to be the winner. The Messiah is supposed to be the one that pulls us out of our Roman oppression and becomes the king and sits on David's throne and he's dead. So they're just in shock. And the text doesn't tell us about this here. Um, some of the other gospels do give us a few more details about what happens on Friday night and Saturday. Um, but it's sad. And they're freaking out and they don't know. Did we just, was he lying? Were we wrong? Their hearts are broken and their brains are confused and then the sun starts to come up on Sunday morning, at which time they need to get back to business as far as taking care of his dead body. And it's women who do this sort of chore. So the women get up. And it's a little bit scary for them to do this because this was a criminal. They don't really want to be associated with a criminal or they could possibly get in trouble too. So they get up first thing in the morning. Um, they're all alone. And they get there to take care of the body. And the body is gone. They assume that somebody stole it. Uh, who knows? They're terrified. They're confused. As if they weren't already terrified and confused all day Friday and Saturday anyway. And then there's an angel here who says, don't be sad, don't be confused. He's resurrected. And of course, this changes everything. And this is the climax of the whole Jesus story. And this is what makes the Jesus story different. Because he does win in the end, but in a strange kind of way. Let's talk about um, how Christians celebrate um, this story, which is really the absolute core of Christianity which is the most populous religion in the world. And we just got finished celebrating um, Holy Week. It's what's known as Holy Week. So Sunday is Palm Sunday, which celebrates when he got to Jerusalem. Thursday is called Maundy Thursday. And Thursday is the night of the Lord's Supper. Um, and also, just to uh, remind you, this is where da Vinci's famous painting comes from, that Lord's Supper painting. And so that's what you're celebrating for those of you who happen to go to church on Thursday night. Um, there'll usually be communion on that Thursday night. And sometimes there will be foot washing. Um, 
which is something else that Jesus did at that supper. And again, it's supposed to emphasize that theme of brotherly love, humility. You're lowering yourself to cleaning somebody's dirty feet, their dirty, sore, tired feet. So it's an act of humility and it's an act of love. And those are supposed to be the two biggest themes of Christianity. So that's Thursday. Friday's the day of crucifixion. It's, it's called Good Friday. Kind of an ironic name. Um, if you go to church on Good Friday, then there would be it would be a dark ceremony. Um, Saturday, you don't go to church. You just sit at home, basically kind of meditating and being sad. And then Sunday morning is the day of celebration. Of course, that's Easter and all the colors come back. And um, Lent, for those of you who observe Lent, Lent is over and so you get to eat your favorite treats again and it's a big day of celebration and this is the reason why Christians go to church on Sunday um, and Jews go to synagogue on the Sabbath on Saturday. So just a little bit of cultural information for you there. Uh, point number 10, let's take another quick look at the last chapter and do a little bit of what we've called textual criticism. Um, depending on which version you read, you may have already noticed that those last, um, what, like 11 verses of the book are in debate. Um, I'm holding an NIV copy of the Bible right here, and here's what the actual copy of the Bible says. The earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So some manuscripts say that this story ends with this line. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. But then other manuscripts go on and ended on a very different, much more kind of note of finality where um, we get a little bit of information about Jesus' uh, appearance after his resurrection. And uh, the, the final verse in some manuscripts is, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So there are certainly... Um, believers in the Bible who have differing opinions about these final 11 verses and whether they're supposed to be in the Bible and whether they're supposed to be studied as holy and scriptural or not. So that's a great example of textual criticism. One other little note is, I've already told you that there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tell the life story of Jesus. They tell basically the same story. Um, some of them include his childhood and his birth, and some, like Mark, do not. Some of them are long. Some of them are short. Um, they, they do have little bits of differences as well, um, and I'll just give you one example. Um, in some of the Gospels, there's one angel at the tomb, and in some of the other Gospels, there are two angels at the tomb. Does that matter? That's up to you. Some people say that's evidence that the Bible is not perfect. Some people say that it doesn't matter because the number of angels is irrelevant. But those are just some, uh, some textual notes that you might find interesting. All right, we're at 28 minutes. So this is going to be a little bit longer than a 30-minute lesson. But what we want to do now is some final literary interpretation of this story. This story changed the world. And I'm not going to make any value judgment about whether it should be believed or not believed. But objectively speaking, this story, which the earliest Christians called the good news, the gospel, started a new religion that became the most populous religion and um, contributed to a book that has, is probably the bestseller of all time. Um, and the story itself has got to have literary merit or it's not going to be that captivating. So there are literary, there's literary magnificence here. And so I want to talk about two items of literary interest. One of them is a motif of sacrifice and blood. 
throughout the whole Bible that culminates with the death of Jesus. So here's a quick list um, of where we've seen bloody sacrifices starting at the very beginning in Genesis, because we've been hitting the most important stories out of these 66 books. Number one, chapter four of the Bible, the sacrifice of Cain and Abel. The only sacrifice that was acceptable was the one of an animal. Sacrificing veggies, no good. Number two, uh, the first thing that Noah did when he got off the boat was offer a sacrifice of thanks. Number three, um, Abraham has quite a few uh, episodes of bloodshed. And we've already studied the significance of bloodshed in the ancient world, that historical criticism that we've learned about already, that blood wasn't as horrifying to the ancient world as it is to us. We don't see a lot of blood. Even when we're going to have a nice steak dinner, we don't have to see the cow die and the blood shed. We just go and have our burger at the restaurant or pick up the meat already wrapped up from the butcher, right? So this whole idea of sacrifice and blood wasn't as horrifying in the ancient world. Um, but the Abraham story is interesting because he almost has to sacrifice his son, but then God sends an angel and a ram and says, nope, you don't have to do this. So this sets Judaism apart from some of the other like Mesopotamian religions that believed in human sacrifice. Yahweh does not want human sacrifice. Um, and then we've got Moses and the Passover, and you know the significance of that. Then we um, follow Jesus into Jerusalem and we have the sacrifice of the birds uh, at the temple, the perfect white doves at the temple. Um, and then we have the, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper with the communion, where we've got this symbolic sacrifice going on, where they're eating the bread, which represents the flesh, and they're drinking the wine, which represents the blood. And then Jesus dies on the cross, more blood, more sacrifice. And so it all kind of ties together. Let's see if we can find the theme in this motif. One of the things we learned early in the year when we were solidifying our list of key literary terms was that motifs give you unity and pattern. So we definitely see this unifying pattern of sacrificial bloodshed throughout the Bible. Um, and in the Old Testament, it seemed to be all about fulfilling the law. It was the law. It was the rule. You had to do these things. Cain had to do it. Noah had to do it. Abraham had to do it. Moses had to do it. It was, it was the rule. And it was about perfection. You had to have the perfect kind of clean lamb. You had to have the perfect white kind of bird. And it had to do with um, laying down something of perfect value to God and saying, don't hate me. I'm going to give you something great so that you won't be mad. Or I know that I'm terrible, so let me bow my knee and kill something of value to demonstrate how sorry I am for being dirty, for being messed up. And when you see how truly sorry I am, because I've just killed my best lamb, then you'll understand how sorry I am and you'll have pity on me because you're a good God and we'll be good. Everything will be good between us. That was kind of the basic idea in Judaism. Um, now, other cultures had animal sacrifice, but it wasn't so much the idea of love between God and man uh, as fear. But at any rate, they did all have that in common was you would kill an animal to demonstrate to God how sorry you were for being a rotten, dirty human who messed up all the time so that God would have pity on you and forgive you. When we get to the New Testament and we see Jesus on the cross, this kind of changes everything. Because if God is going to put the Messiah on the altar if the son of god is going to lay on the altar and just basically submit to death i mean jesus could have gotten out of it if he wanted to he lets them do it he's he's just submits to execution 
there's no point in human beings doing any more sacrifices because no lamb or dove now can ever measure up to God on the altar. God laying God on the altar is kind of a way of saying, enough. No more killing. No more bloodshed. I don't like it anyway. So we're finished with it. I've given, here's the ultimate sacrifice. Take a look at this ultimate sacrifice and let's let it go. And let's kind of move on with our eyes on Jesus now. And so now every time Christians take communion, it's a, it's, it's a memory of that blood and that flesh and that sacrifice um, and it, it's a reminder, ah, oh yeah, we're okay with God. We're okay with God. He took the ultimate sacrifice. We're okay. It's going to be okay. And then the final evidence that it's going to be okay is that Jesus comes to life again and demonstrates that there's life after death. So not only are we okay with God, but we don't even have to be afraid of dying because after death, the spirit lives on, obviously, and if our spirit lives on with a God who's not mad at us, then that might be something like heaven. And so again, this is what makes Christianity a missional kind of religion because it's supposed to communicate this great hope that you're okay with God even after you die. You're going to be okay with God. You're not going to have to go to Hades or Tartarus. Again, kind of going back to love. Final point. We've got a new kind of hero on our hands, too. People have been fascinated with the Jesus story for 2,000 years, even people who don't believe he's God. They think it's a great story. And it's because he's a new kind of hero. Yes, he is an everyman hero, in a way, up to a point. But he's also God, and he does some really amazing things. So in a way, he's like an epic or a monomyth hero. Um, but in a really strange sort of way. He doesn't defeat his enemies. The bad guy wins. This is bizarre. This is not like your typical epic. This is not like your typical monomyth story. Where the big superhero fights for good and he defeats the bad guy. Way! That's not what happens. Jesus says, yeah, I'm the Messiah. What are you going to do about it? Oh, you're going to kill me? Okay, take me. And he submits to death. And he knew it was coming. You knew that he knew he was coming because he foreshadowed it. Um, so this is a new kind of hero. And this kind of heroism has captivated humanity for 2,000 years. Um, so the new kind of hero is called a Christ figure. And the Christ figure basically loses in order to win. He lets the bad guys win. It's basically the good guy laying down his gun, throwing his hands up, letting the bad guy win, but then ultimately winning anyway in the end. It's, um, it's a pretty emotional kind of heroism. Very unique, very, very powerful, and in a way, it's an even bigger win. So uh, there's tons of stories in the world that are not Christian at all in their message, not even written by Christians, who pattern their protagonists after Jesus. They make their protagonists a Christ figure type of hero simply because it is such an emotionally dramatic and heart-wrenching and triumphant kind of hero pattern. Um, your Christ figures are typically male with humble roots, humble every man kind of roots. They're often wrapped up in some kind of prophecy, not always, but often. Um, they work for the greater good and they lose the battle to their antagonists as a very unique way of winning at the end. And it usually happens, well, in a, in, a, in a Christ figure type story, it happens through death and resurrection. The Christ figure will die and then come to life again. 
Now, sometimes it will just look like he's dead or we'll think he's dead for a few minutes and then we'll find out he's not. But even so, it's the same emotional journey for the storytelling. So it can be a literal death and a resurrection, like in a fantasy story, or it can be a more figurative or mistaken death in a more realistic story. Here's a few examples. Harry Potter in the final book. Think about it. Male, humble roots, you know, grew up under the stairs. Prophecy, the greater good dies to win at the end with the resurrection. Superman, particularly in the movie Superman Returns. Gandalf, or Gandalf, sorry, I said that wrong, from Lord of the Rings. Um, he dies in order that the Fellowship of the Ring can succeed, but that he comes back again in this glowing form known as Gandalf the White. Very, very intentionally a representation of Jesus. Um, the Black Panther movie, exactly the same. And uh, I know just one more movie. Um, it's a child's movie. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's called The Iron Giant. Um, but I remember watching it with my kid when she was um, younger, and she's roughly y'all's age. Um, and that one is really wonderful. One thing I want to note about um, some of your film Christ figures uh, is that sometimes, as a special little cinematic touch, when the Christ figure is dying, their body will be laid out across the screen in the shape of a cross. And this will be done very intentionally to evoke those Jesus thoughts so that you'll kind of notice what's happening. Um, they'll die in that cross formation and then they'll come back to life again, triumphant, with those themes of love, sacrificial death, and ultimate triumph for the betterment of humanity. And uh, that wraps us up for our study of the Jesus story from the Gospel of Mark. A little over 40 minutes, not too bad. Basically the same thing as sitting in on one English class. And um, I hope you took good notes. I will see you guys on Monday to completely wrap up all of our New Testament material. Um, and on Monday, I'll let you know what we are going to do next. But you will need your notes from both videos on Monday. That is all.